Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at an Astrophysics Riccardi Honders. It's a 12 inch F3.85 dedicated astrograph. Well, where is it you might be asking? Well, when telescopes get this big, they don't come here, I have to go to them. So let's take a trip. So one challenge in getting to see this particular Honders is getting there. Larry lives about, and it's only about 45 minutes away, but it feels like it's a whole nother world out here. You've got a lot of dirt roads here. Some of these are unmarked, and I'm not even sure some of these roads here are even official and they really exist. So, but that's good for astronomy because the more remote your place is, generally, the darker your skies are. So there are different kinds of observatories. There's the traditional kind with the dome on the top. It's probably what you think of when you think of the word observatory. There may be certain circumstances where that isn't practical. Uh, for example, there may be local building ordinances against such structures. It may not sit well domestically. Some people may be worried about what it does to their property values or not advertising the fact that they have an expensive telescope on their property. So in those cases, what you do is you do something like this. It's a roll off and it looks just like a storage shed when the roof is closed. The only thing that gives it away is those rails that the roof comes off on. So Larry's been kind enough to open the observatory for us. So let's go ahead inside. So the way that you open the roof is you grab this winch and it's on a rope and you winch this thing open. And of course it's already open so we can just head inside. So we're inside the observatory now. It's about 12 by 16 feet here. And this is how you close it. You take this winch and you wind it and it's on a rope. It pulls the roof shut. It takes about 200 turns of this to close it. And Larry has thought about putting a motor on it, but there are some concerns if you do that. For example, if something gets jammed, you have to put some overload considerations in there. It could be done, but for now it's a manual only system. Now the roof weighs about 550 pounds and it rides on these rails. So here's a close up of the pier. It's pretty big, 24 inches around concrete. This pipe is an old water pipe that Larry found and had a club member weld this for him so that he could put the mount on it. So again, in the north here, it's pretty cold in the winter time. The frost line is somewhere around four feet. So it's gotta go down deeper than that. You'll also notice that the floor is in no way coupled to the concrete pier. There's a gap between the pier and the floorboards. This is what you're supposed to do. You can jump up and down all you want on the floor and it's not going to affect the pier at all. So we're here with the scope on a Paramount ME mount. This is a common mount that's used for larger telescopes in permanent installations. They do make a tripod for it in case you want to use it portably, but most of the time you'll see this in a permanent installation like this one. So when you come across a Paramount, it comes with a joystick like this one, and I'll instinctively do this to troubleshoot it. There's a button on the top, I don't know if you can see that, but if you tap the button twice, what the scope does is it moves to what it's called the home position. Now the home position on a Paramount isn't the so-called flat position, and it's not the so-called showroom position with the axis up in the air. It's this here, and you're going to wait for two sets of three beeps. There's the first one. There we go. So if you tap tap on a Paramount, you see it go to this position, you hear the two beeps, life is good. Okay, so on this Paramount, you'll notice a sophisticated device here. This is called a plastic bag. And the purpose of the plastic bag is there is a hole where the cables come out of. You do need to plug that up somehow. If you don't, certain things can happen when the telescope is out in the wild like this. Not long ago, I was called up to the observatory at Dartmouth and they had this problem where when they turned on the mount, it wouldn't home. It would just sort of twirl around and around until it tripped out on some sort of error code. Well, it turned out because they hadn't plugged this hole, a critter had made its way inside, had made a meal out of the wire and all of the insulation, and all of that had to get replaced. Okay, so what in the world is a Honders? Well, in its purest form, a Honders is a mirror and lens-based telescope system, and superficially, it resembles a Newtonian reflector of all things, complete with the eyepiece sticking out the side. 
Now it isn't a Newtonian reflector, there's a lot more going on inside, but on the outside that's how it appears. You rarely if ever see a pure Honders out there. Rather, what you do see is one of these variants, and the most common one you'll see is this one. It's the Riccardi Honders, and even then, those are pretty rare. I know a grand total of two of these on the market right now. This one, and the one from Europe, I saw a prototype of that one at NEF a few years ago. Neither one of these brands are cheap. So, why would you want a Honders? Why would you want to do something like this? Well, in the astrophysics version, this one is a proprietary variation on the Riccardi Honders. They don't tell you what's in it. I can tell you by looking in both ends of this thing, it appears to be quite complicated inside. So this thing has an enormous flat field. It's said to be up to three degrees. It'll cover a full frame sensor on a camera. It's sharp all the way to the edges. There is no field curvature. It really is quite remarkable. The other thing is it is insanely fast. So this telescope is a 12 inch F 3.85 optical system with a focal length of 1159 millimeters. When was the last time you heard those three numbers in the same sentence? So this could make a claim as being the ideal deep sky imaging telescope. So it's set up for imaging, but there's no reason why you can't look through it. It comes with a two inch visual back and you could put a diagonal or an eyepiece or whatever you want back there. Just keep in mind, at f3.85, you're going to run into some exit pupil issues, so you're going to be limited to eyepieces in that, you know, 17 to 19 millimeter range or shorter. And I found if you're looking through it, you know, that large central obstruction makes it a little bit difficult. You're going to have to bump the power up a little bit to look through it. But most people don't buy these things for visual use. They buy them because they take incredible deep sky images very fast. Okay, so what are some of the disadvantages of this design? Well, there is that enormous central obstruction. 5.9 inches, almost 50% obstructed here. I found with some images I've taken here, there will be these little halos around stars. And I know you can correct for that in Photoshop. I usually just leave that alone. Then there's the issue of price and availability. $22,500 for the optical tube assembly and Astrophysics sells every one of these that they can make. If you want one of these, if you have the money, you're probably gonna have to get on a waiting list and don't be surprised if you're waiting years to get yours. And you're not done when you spend that money. You've got to get the mount, all the accessories, the imaging equipment. Don't be surprised if you wind up spending twice that amount to get a fully functioning rig operating. I have a friend who says, if you're going to put together a complete Honda's rig and you want to do it correctly, you really need to budget $50,000 US. You might not use it all, and if that case, you can pat yourself on the back and feel good. Well, so to speak. Looks like it's gonna be a really clear night, so there's not much to do but wait for it to get dark, and let's see what happens. So we're sitting here in the observatory and taking some images. I think everything's up and running. It's awfully cold out. This is the first really cold night of the year. It's about 23 degrees Fahrenheit. Not that cold for New Hampshire, but those first cold nights are, always seem to be the worst. So we're taking a picture of M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, right now. And uh, I have people often ask me, astroimaging, it looks so exciting and so interesting. Well, you're looking at it. Yes, isn't this exciting? A lot of it is just sitting around and waiting. Okay, so how did this work out? Well, you know what they say, Murphy's Law was built for astrophotography. We had all the parts together to image through the Honders with my Canon EOS 5D Mark III. It's a modified DSLR that I have. And we discovered at the last minute that the pieces that were supposed to go on the visual back to mount the bayonet to the camera, they didn't fit together properly. Or rather, when we put them together, there was still a rattling and there didn't seem to be any place to close the gap. It's about an eighth of an inch of play in there and that was of course gonna be unacceptable. So we're sitting around the kitchen table and he says, do you have any ideas? And I said, uh, you got any duct tape? So we found some duct tape and I spent about 15 minutes building up a bump on three points on the bayonet to close that eighth of an inch gap to the point where when we tightened it down, it was tight. So there is of course a 0% probability that this thing was even or level, but 
you know, it worked. We were going to just try anything at this point. So by now, I was pretty much giving up on the idea of having any usable images. But you know what? We went ahead and tried it anyway. So when you see me in the observatory in that clip before, I know that that's going on. But Murphy wasn't done with us yet. About halfway through the evening, Larry contacted me. You see, I was in the observatory, but he's in the house about 100 yards away. So he was running the auto guider from the house. That may seem unnecessarily complex, but that's the way he normally does it. And so we decided, let's just leave well enough and alone. Do it the way you normally do it. So he contacts me from the house and he says, the auto guider, it hasn't worked all night long. It looked like it was working, but it wasn't. And it was really odd because he guides with a program called PHD2, which I know some of you use. And PHD2 was showing him something on the screen that appeared to be auto guiding, but of course it was just a big fake out. Nothing was actually happening. So here I am faced with this idea that I've got over 300 images that I had taken through the course of the evening. None of them were auto guided and the visual back was held together by duct tape. <laughs> so when I got home, you know, well, at least it was a good experience. And just before I went to dump all of the images off of the memory card, I figured this was just going to be a lost cause. It was past midnight at this point. I decided to just transfer a few of them over to the computer to see, well, how bad did this get? And you know what? Some of them look pretty good. In fact, a lot of them look pretty good. So I took the images from the double cluster because I know that that one takes usually a minimal amount of processing and I could get through it pretty fast. As I looked through those 300 images or so, I found that over 90% of them were in focus and over 90% of them were tracked. There were no trailing stars. They weren't all perfect, but 90% is pretty good. And knowing Larry, he's a very exacting kind of guy. So his polar alignment on that Paramount was probably excellent. And the Paramount's a good quality product to begin with. Couple that with the very short exposures. I didn't take any exposure over 30 seconds. And you get images that were okay. So now it's about 1 a.m. And I ran the uh, frames from the double cluster through PixInsight and I got this. And I did a double take when I saw this. Boy, is this good. I like this. So in the middle of the night, I emailed Larry. I got an immediate response back. He said, yeah, that looks pretty good. Suffice it to say, I didn't get a lot of sleep that night. I wound up processing a lot of images. So, you know, sometimes when I'm using a telescope, I get the distinct impression that the telescope is better than I am. And this was certainly the case here. I didn't come anywhere near to exhausting the potential of this thing, especially seeing some of the images that you have sent me through this telescope. I need to up my game. In particular, I do need to upgrade the camera. I have been aware of this for some time now. I just don't want to spend the money right now, but I am looking at one of the 8300 based units or perhaps one of the new ASIs with the larger chips. So when that happens, I'm sure I'm going to get a little bit better. So there you have it. A brief look at the astrophysics Riccardi Honda's 12 inch F3.85 dedicated astrograph. I hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.